In this video, I'm going to take a couple of minutes and walk you through the ideas related to structure and data. Uh, talk about some of the core benefits of working in a structured writing environment that's based on data. I'll start off with a couple of ideas, introduce some concepts, and then I'll go into a little bit of what I would do hands-on in a classroom environment, just to give you an overview and a chance to think about stuff on your own. It is not specific to any one XML or data authoring tool either. So these ideas apply across the board. DITA is defined by the OASIS uh, committee as the Darwin Information Typing Architecture, which is a specification for document types so that you can create topic-based content. So they have a nice technical description. According to me, it's a formal structured set of rules that allow you to create content that a lot of people in TechCom work with. DITA enables an enhanced use of the source content in a vendor independent way as well. You don't have to think about who is your software vendor, what content management system are you using, etc. It gives you a structure that you can work with and anyone should be able to pick up and work with it if they claim and correctly claim that they can work with DITA. It should matter to you because it is a growing standard. There's a lot of support from vendors. Adobe, X Metal, and Oxygen are some of the bigger players that are involved in the TechCom side. And there are more companies that are looking for data skills because behind the scenes, there's a lot of interesting stuff that can be done. Again, I'll touch on it a little bit in this video. DITA is not just the idea of structured writing though. It also does introduce best practices such as planning your content, organizing your information, building relationships between topics, and as much as you can, using automation wherever it makes sense. So in a single slide, DITA stands for Darwin information typing architecture. It is about the work related to topic-based content, organizing those topics in maps, using attributes behind the scenes, and potentially specializing the topic into things like a concept or a reference or a task or a glossary. So these are all derived from the topic. There's also a book map, which is based on the map, and different domains. Think of those sort of like character level um, elements and format objects. So you can go in and have software ones, you can have programming, you could have things like bold or italic or underline, but you can also have things like a win title or a UI control. In DITA 1.3, there's more being introduced in regards to pretty much everything related to DITA, but all of these ideas are based on the standard core topics, and it goes back to the idea of really topics, maps, and attributes. Maps and book maps are ways to organize, to plan, to publish your information. It builds a hierarchy. These are some of the really important things to discuss early on. Once you've organized your plan, you've figured out what it is that you're going to publish, you have your map as an idea, do some brainstorming, come up with a lot of topics. Those are the smaller types of information that go into the map, and they're usually organized into task, concept, or reference, which we'll expand on shortly. REL tables build relationships between information on maps. Again, I'll address it a little later in the video. And then there's also specializations. I'm not going to address it in this video. Suffice it to say that in the DITA world, if it turns out there's something you really specifically need and want, and it's not there by default, there is usually a very organized and formal way that you can go in and build it. In behind all of that, behind maps, book maps, topics, rel tables, specializations, are attributes. If you've ever worked with HTML or you're familiar with the idea that in code you could have something like an image, which is then defined with things like a height, a width, or a source. The height, width, and source are considered to be attributes. So let's start off at a high level, talking about maps in the data world, organizing and navigating your content. The map is an organizational tool. It's a little like your document plan or your table of contents, some sort of a hierarchy. It's a bit of a starting point. You start off, you're brainstorming about topics and you organize them. And once you've collected a list of different things that you're going to write about, you might decide, this is the core main topic, and that could be the, the, the source, if you will, of a chapter of information, if that's a model that works for you. It might, however, also be the idea of the entire book, or it could be the purpose of having a component on a website. Once you've figured out that main topic, you'll have one or more subtopics, and those are considered children to the parent. And as you add additional subtopics, they're children, but they also become siblings to each other. And a subject like the last subject that I have in here, the last sub, is a child of the main topic, but it's also apparent to three more levels of subs. And those are the circles for another level of sub, another one which is also a child, and the last one. And again, 
all three of these are siblings to each other. When published, this content could be collected into something with a title for the main topic, heading ones for the first sub, the other sub, the last sub, and then heading twos when you get into the third level. You could also decide that you're going to split this and create seven web pages, etc. There's all kinds of options. It's just one way of organizing your information. Links between the parent and the child, so from the main to the first and to the next sub and to the last sub, can automatically be inserted. And the same thing with links between siblings, so that the last three uh, sub-levels could link to each other, or the middle three sub-levels could link to each other. What's interesting is that the last sub, which has the green star, that could have a bunch of links. It could have a link up to the main topic. It could have a link to its two siblings, and it could also have links to its three descendants, and all of those could be automated, which means if you ever reorganize the map, all of those links would correctly be rebuilt without you having to do manual work. And lastly, if you wanted links between pieces in here that aren't directly related, you can use something called a rel table. Again, I'll address it a little later. So a sample map might be the first column here where I'm going to organize a bunch of information so that people can get to know about DITA. That's going to be my high level topic. And underneath that, I'm going to have a discussion about some of the core topic types that every user should know without getting into too much information. And then I will have four subordinates where I specifically speak to the task concept reference topic. At a higher level, I also want to introduce people to the idea of attributes rel tables, and DITA val files. So I have a primary topic, getting to know DITA. I have my first subordinate, core topic types that every user should know, and that will, of course, link to the four children, task concept reference topic. Those, in turn, can link to each other and back up to the core topic types. And attribute, rel table, and DITA val. These last three are siblings to my core topic types that I'm talking about, and those four would link to each other as well. So there's some planning that goes into this, there's a lot of brainstorming to come up with the ideas, and then I organize my information, and I have a starting point. That's what my map has done. When it gets time to develop any specific content within the DITA world, you start off by planning the map, but now that I have my map, I would, for each of the topics, create a high-level structure with some sort of a nice, clear, easy-to-understand title, a short description, usually no more than one or two sentences, is suggested and prologue information who's the author what's the due date on this uh, who is my big picture audience those types of things if needed then as people start to provide me content i go back to each of the individual topics and i populate the content so let's talk a little bit about the task concept reference and topic these are the big four the fantastic four when it comes to data there are multiple types of topics the task is what a user needs to do. The core step-by-step, -step, one, two, and three of what they need to do. The concepts would support the task, and in a lot of cases, the concepts provide some clear conceptual model that might be lacking in a task. It helps orient the users. It's background information to get somebody started. And lastly, the reference. This is a quick lookup in most cases. You don't put in a procedural information conceptual. It's very much, Here's a, a clear illustration of something. Here is a lookup table. Here is a bullet list of the parts. Nice technical. And you'll notice in tiny little print down at the bottom, I have topic. This is a base to create your task or concept or reference. It's used for specialization. And it's only really used if there's no other true fit. I have mocked up a little content later on. I do use all four of these, so you have a chance to see them in use. It's not to say that it's a perfect example, but it's a decent example to show you a little bit about each of them. Every single topic, no matter what it is, task, concept, reference, generic topic, should start off with a title. Nice, clear, easy to read. Titles are also used by things like sections, examples, figures, and tables. So the title is really important in the data world. It's used for things like cross-references. It's used for things like a generated table of contents. As you create your topics, yes, the title is important, but also think about your short description. Just a nice initial brief statement that doesn't repeat the title word for word, but enhances it and adds value. And then a prologue. This is metadata. It's information about a topic that you're not likely going to see in the print, but it helps manage the content. Again, this could be something like, who is the author? Or who is the audience? What are the due dates? What keywords are relevant to this information? Then you start writing. You start with a task. Remember, people are likely doing things and they realize they need to look up your documentation. So the task is where they turn to your material. Make sure you give them an answer. 
tell the user exactly what to do and the order in which to do it so that there's success. This is your step-by-step -step instructions and its purpose is to enable a user to actually do something, to go from start to end and say, yes, I have successfully resolved a problem that I ran into. You may have to support the task with additional concepts and references. So you may talk about what something is or why someone would do something at a higher level. The references is more of your technical specifications. And again, I'll have a little example a bit later in the presentation of all of these pieces. So in the data world, the task, how? It tells the user what to do, the order in which to do it, and it's a step-by-step -step set of instructions that lets them achieve something. The structure of it is, again, as mentioned earlier, a title, a short description, a prologue, and then the task body. And you'll see that title, short desk, and prologue are common in almost everything you do in DITA. So the nice thing is, once you understand how the title, the short desk, the prologue work, you already have a good chunk of what goes into DITA figured out. The task body and the concept body and the reference body, those have some unique pieces that go in them. So that's where you'll still have to do more learning. Concepts. If somebody's wondering why they should do something, what's the benefit? Then a concept is a place where you can expand on this. And it's sort of like the good marketing. It tells you what it is, why you want it. It provides a lot of great background information and gets somebody interested in what you're writing. Now, the cool thing is that in the DITA world, they specified this is what is or why. It's the initial information. The last bullet. It supports the task by providing an explanation that's outside the scope of the task. So if I'm writing to someone and I'm explaining to them how to print a document, I don't want to be in a situation where I explain why they would want to print it. It doesn't make any sense. They already hopefully know that. If I get into something a little more technical and I have a task such as performing a heart transplant, I might want to provide some background conceptual information to introduce why a heart transplant is important, some of the things that you might want to think about before you consider a heart transplant, who good candidates are at a high level, then I might go through and have specific tasks on how to identify whether or not you're a candidate for a heart transplant, or I may even have very technical task information that talks through how to perform a heart transplant. The structure of a concept is surprisingly familiar. This is similar to what we've already seen when we talked about the task. There's the title, short description, the prologue, and then you get into a specific concept body, and that has ways to organize information. References are the techie stuff. You already know the big picture. You understand the concept. You know the how-to, the step-by-step -step and the task, but you need some specific details. For example, when you go into print and you get the dialogue and there's a bunch of options in it and you're not exactly certain what the collate option might do or what flip over and flip up mean, that's where you might go to a reference and look something up. In addition, if you're doing, say, heart transplant, you might need some technical references perhaps some information that's looked up in regards to specific blood type combinations so that you can help reduce the risk of an organ being rejected. So DITA says quick access to facts, tables, lists, often alphabetical lookup information. Scan, go. Again, the structure is title, short desk, prologue, and then it gets into the specific reference body. Now, for the non-data purist, if we're looking at generic topics, this is what you use when you can't make it a concept, can't make it a task, a reference, or it's a starting point for specialization. Realistically, by and large, I suggest you avoid them. According to DITA, it is the top level element for a single subject or an article, the starting point for all other base topic types, that gets a little geeky, and it's used if nothing else applies. So by and large, try to make sure your content is a concept or a task or a reference. Again, title, short desk, prologue, and then into the body. So we've talked a little bit about all of the uh, core four elements that make up topic types in DITA, the task, the concept, the reference, and the generic topic. Attributes are behind the scenes. If you've worked with HTML, you may have seen image with height, width, and source. Well, in DITA, you have different things like display attributes. So you can say this information should be framed and then the graphic gets a box around it or scale it to 90% or 50%. You can uniquely identify information. We'll get back to selection attributes a little later, but imagine being able to go in and define things as having a specific platform or product or audience that they are relevant to. There are topic refs inside a map. You might want to be able to go in and say 
hey, this stuff should not be in the table of contents or it should only be included in the print material or not available for search. And lastly, a couple of universal attributes, the big ones being translate. Do you want this to be translated? And if so, what language? So there's a lot of attributes that are available almost everywhere and they add a lot of functionality to any element. Linking and publishing is cool in the data world as well. There's something called a rel table and I've got a sample on the screen I'll get to in a moment. These are used with a map to build a set of links beyond the default parent child or between siblings. So in this example, columns could be defined so that I have all my tasks in one, my concept in another, my reference in a last, and each row is one set of linked content. So in this example, the task on how to create a PDF and the concept on why PDF is a great format, even if they're not parent and child, even if they're not siblings, they still link to each other. In my middle column for the body, I have import content and export content in the same chunk under tasks. I want both of those to reference each other so that if somebody reads about how to import, they also see about how to export. And if they export, they also read about import. Plus, if you look all the way across, no concepts, but the reference of supported formats is there. So whether you import or export, you should know about the other and you should know what formats we support as a big picture. Now you can dive in and say, do you support HTML? Do you support XML, et cetera, et cetera. And at the very bottom, saving a file or saving it in a new format, that should also talk about why you would use save or save as. And again, it should all link back and forth, all four of these things to each other, including a link into supported formats to identify that yes, we allow you to save or save as to PDF, we allow you to save as XML, we allow you to save as a Word document or a FrameMaker file. All right, almost at the example, but conditional publishing. This gets a little deeper dive, a little more technical. There's something called a rel table, and this is where you can define content that you want to include or exclude. So a map could have a topic reference, or a task could have a step, and then you could define that this entire topic is applicable to a specific audience, either your expert or your novice, or that this step is only performed if you're on a Mac or a Windows machine. And here's what's cool. At publishing time, a DITAVAL file can then be referenced so that you create output, and in the VAL, you can specify what to include or exclude. So I could use multiple val files and I could say, here's one that will include expert and include Mac so that I get the expert Macintosh user guide. I could also have one that excludes experts and excludes Windows. Now I get the novice Mac user guide. So I can use combinations and depending on the tools, include or exclude statements are used. I can include novice and exclude the Mac. So now I end up by having the included novice non-Mac, I get the novice Windows guide. So inside my content, I've taken my map, I've taken my topics, I've taken my concepts and references, I've set them up so that they have specific attributes for elements, and now I can decide to include or exclude, and as an author, I get to see everything. As a reviewer, I get to see everything. Maybe it's formatted so that expert is in blue and novice is in red, or Mac has a, uh, a yellow background and Windows has a gray background. I can review, edit, publish from one source, but the finished output could use a DITAVAL file to create something that is specific to my audience. So it's a really cool feature. It gets a bit more tech. Let's get into the idea of the hands-on. What do you actually do when you want to start writing topics? Start off by simplifying your content. Topics can be created by focusing into one key thought. And I'll show you an example shortly. You reduce what you're going to write to a very small focus. So you're not going to write everything that you possibly can. When you get started, start small. Imagine breaking a set of chapters into smaller sections. You would go through, you'd probably identify your heading ones, your heading twos, you'd see if there's a logical break somewhere. You would check for visual prompts in the material, even things like a page turn or a horizontal rule that appears on the page, or maybe something that goes from heading one to heading two to heading three. Also, think about where it is that somebody could actually just take a break during the reading, because that might be a logical place to break content from one larger piece into a smaller one. You also need to clean up source content. In a lot of cases, you get that stream of thought from a subject matter expert. I don't even know how many times I look at it and I say, here's too much. And they're not doing it out of spite. They just want to make sure genuinely that they've delivered everything that I'm going to need. So 
I end up with a lot of text and I have to analyze it and clean it up and sort it out and identify it's going to be a map. I have to have concepts and tasks and references. I've got to organize everything. I'm going to show you a source that you can rework. Now, at this point, you may want to get to the next slide. And as you look at it, you'll pause. You can pause the video. You can mark up the slide. You can use a highlighter, a pen, whatever. You can write it up in Word, uh, take a picture of it on the screen and print it apply formats to it, whatever, identify the topic types, try to find ways to say this sentence is a task or this sentence is a concept or a reference. And I will show you the slide and I will also show you a couple of examples here in the video. But you can ID and then rework the information so that you write a task, a concept, a reference. I usually find that when I give somebody a paper copy and a set of highlighters and I say go, it takes them about five minutes. And I often like to have a chat-based Q&A. If I'm doing this online as a webinar, I'll do it in that way. If I'm doing it in a classroom, I'll have the actual conversation and I usually have more than one source. But feel free to take these ideas and use them in a conversation in order to develop your own ideas for organizing content. So there's the text. Pause the video if you want. Start to read it right now if you'd like to. Each of these sentences, it would be great to identify, is it that sentence on its own a task, a concept, a reference? Now, about a third, two thirds, maybe halfway, there's a sentence that reads to insert an image in any one of these applications. You can use the insert menu and choose picture after you select location. That's a great one to identify as a task. So pause if you want to. I'm going to move ahead in just a moment to the next slide where I actually start to break this down piece by piece. So. I would tell people Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint allow you to insert a graph. Great idea. Maybe a concept. It's not really technical information. It's not telling me how. Graphical images add values to document by making it easier to see any type of info as a picture. Great. Okay. Good idea. Concept on why graphics might be useful. They also break up content rich material. Okay. Great. More probably concept info. Many formats, including common ones, JPEG, GIF, BMP, or PDF are supported. As soon as I see some of those extensions, I start to think this might be a reference. So at this point, I may have gone through and taken a highlighter, and I'm using blue for task and green for concept and yellow for reference, and I'm just highlighting individual sentences. To insert an image, we already talked about that one as a task. Choose and import an image, sounds like task. Make sure you manage graphics well. That could be a, a totally separate topic. Uh, in regards to how you manage graphics well. So that could become a concept on its own. Uh, you may want one folder. Again, this could relate to how you manage graphics. So as I go through and I take my source content and I organize it, what I like to do is something like this. I leave in black Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint allow you to insert a graphic. Not sure. It's undecided. The green stuff is concept, and I've got some at the beginning, some at the end. I have a red task and I have a blue reference in there. And then I just reorganize the content into something that looks like this. There's my task. There's my concept. There's my reference. And all I've done is reorganize the sentences. So at this point, I can go to the subject matter expert and say, did I capture the information that you wanted me to capture? Is it organized into a fashion that generally makes sense? Then I start to rework it. And I get something like this. Here's my task on adding pictures. Graphics can quickly represent complex ideas visually. Prerequisite, do this. Step one, two, three, four, when done, position or size the image. That's my task, much clearer. Here's my concept, reasons to use pictures. It mentions graphics add value. I put in a tip here about managing the graphics well, and then I wrap up with my technical reference. Formats can be imported. Here's the format, the type or the definition, and a couple of notes comparing JPEGs and GIF or GIF, depending on what your preference is. So let's take a quick look at the before, take a quick look at the after. This is what I started with, a bunch of text. It's in two columns because in this slide, I want to be able to fit the information and still give you the chance to read it without cramming everything on, and I needed a title. So there's my initial text. This is the map that I planned. I planned I'm going to work with pictures, add pictures, reasons to use pictures, and supported picture formats. This map that I've planned, and I haven't done any rewrite yet, has one highest level parent and three children. When published, I could have one PDF page that I hand somebody. I could have four web pages. It could be part of a much larger document set, and this is a chapter. Doesn't matter to me. From a data standpoint, I create a map, I organize my topics, and then I start to create. The map itself organizes the information, but each topic is a discrete piece of content. I could reuse it anywhere. I could plug in reasons to use pictures into a completely different publication if I've written it well. 
or supported picture formats instead of under working with pictures maybe that goes into file formats maybe it goes into image manipulation maybe it goes into working with photoshop the next slide shows one way that this map could be published working with pictures that was my high level topic it has an introduction a short description that reads word excel and powerpoint allow you to insert graphics and then in the map i had three nested subordinates one for the task on how to add pictures one on reasons to use pictures which was my concept and one on supported picture formats which was my reference you can pause this you can take a look at it you can compare it to a slide or two earlier in order to get a big picture idea of some of the things that i've done lastly in behind the scenes if you want to know a little bit about the geeky code here's some of the things this is a really small bit of data it talks about a bunch of things it's showing a bunch of code etc next slide should make it a little clearer that's the human readable part buying a car when shopping for a car there's three primary types of vehicles people consider and i have a chunk with information a section on gas on gas electric and a third and final one on just electric but if i look at it in a little different way i can say look elements in red attributes in blue i have a topic it contains title short description the body is made up of three sections each section has a title etc 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 and the topic and the sections have a unique identifier an id that's an attribute in the data editor or in a tags on view i might see something like this so it's a human friendly way to read it it's a way that i can take the information work with it identify where it is see a little bit of format to it you can write in the code you can write inside the editor this happens to be inside FrameMaker. so that ends the slideshow Hopefully it helps clarify a little bit more about what data is, how to organize, how to work with it, and provides a brief sample and an overview. Hope it was useful to you. Look forward to hearing any comments.